Oh, hang on. Yeah, what, what, what is this podcast? <laughs> Was it? Are you underrated? Welcome, guys, gals, and non-binary pals to a brand new season of Over Underrated with Fran and Babs. This is Babs speaking, and we missed you and missed talking to each other and talking to special guests about music, for this is a music podcast. If this is the first time you listen to it, I just want to quickly outline it. So Fran and I pick a theme. We choose a band of artists that's considered overrated and underrated within that theme. And then we each make each other a 10-track playlist and some episodes for this season a fun track playlist. Go away and listen to it and then come back together to discuss or argue that we're the ones on the right. Because Fran and I have some things in common. Music taste-wise, definitely rock, electro and pop feature quite highly. But when it comes to specifics, it's a little bit more complicated sometimes. And sometimes we have special guests to rile us up or agree with us, as is the want of the episode. For this first one to kick off, we've gone to California and I'm by the beach, as you can hear. I'm not really by the beach because I live in Brussels where there's not even a river, but you know, I can dream. And we've gone for Queens of the Stone Age as overrated and Group Love as underrated. I've picked Queens of the Stone Age as overrated, but I don't think they're overrated. I will be defending them to Fran and you will hear that I wasn't feeling very positive about this when we started. Fran has picked Group Love, who are an amazing live act, one of the last band that he saw just before lockdown, and I didn't know anything about them. So I hope you enjoy it, and I will be back to have a little bit of a chat in the middle of the episode and at the end. Bye! Welcome to a new season of Over Underrated, a music podcast with Fran and Babs. How are we all doing? Including yourself, Fran. Well, um, although this will be in the future, at the moment we are still in lockdown free in the UK, but hopefully by the spring I will be allowed to leave the house and who knows what adventures I can get up to. How about yourself? Uh, so still in lockdown as well, although as we were discussing, hairdressers have opened up where I am and I have secured myself an appointment tomorrow to cut my unruly hair. Uh, very excited about that. Jealous. And uh, to be honest, I think, you know, I've been back in Brussels for a few weeks. I was in Luxembourg over Christmas and I had to complete the one week quarantine and it was absolutely brutal. So any situation that al- allows me to actually leave the house is a uh, positive. So... I'm doing it. But luckily, we had music all along. Music there all the time. Yes. And listen, guys, we have not stopped rating overrated and underrated bands. And this week, we've chosen a big old area as our theme. It is California today. Fran, what comes to your mind when I say the word California to you? (laughs) Well, um, I think of a Polaroid photograph taken in 1986 of me in Bournemouth Gardens wearing a bright pink t-shirt with the words California which was so big it had to be tied to the side with a bow Um, because (laughs) listeners my uncle and auntie used to live in California and when they came to visit they obviously thought they'd buy me a massive pink California t-shirt because obviously at the age of six years old I would love hot pink and I still do. Absolutely. So apart and apart from that, that I have been to um to LA and it's interesting. I did celebrate one of my birthdays in San Francisco, and it's one of my favorite places in America. So if you are in San Francisco and you're listening to this podcast, hello and can I stay with you? Um musically though, I would think of the Beast Boys, probably. And I wouldn't straight away think of the bands we're gonna talk about. But how about you? What What springs to mind with California for Babs? So, yeah, the closest I got to California was Oregon State. I went to Portland in 2011, I think, and had plans to return there to see a friend who now lives there. Had plans to head on down to San Fran. But alas, it did not happen. So for me, California, it evokes a lot of different 
responses in me. So musically, unfortunately, it does remind me of the Phantom Planet California, California <laughs> song, because I was around 19 when the OC came out and that was very popular. Obviously, California Dreaming by Mamas and Papas, California Girls by Katy Perry. But when I really started thinking about the kind of music, it is quite broad because you have obviously like West Coast rap brat punk as i've called it you know green day and and the offspring a lot of influential american rock bands on the kind of weird uh, genre blending spectrum so incubus tool corn lincoln park deftones and system of a down are all from california so that's that's a lot of influence there if you're talking east coast new york then hey guys i can talk for hours but for some reason california bands i go blank so it's been interesting doing some research on the two bands we're going to talk about today. And these bands are... Overrated, Queens of the Stone Age, underrated, Group Love. Woohoo! So, in case you need a refresher or this is your first time listening, one of us has picked Queens of the Stone Age as an overrated band. The other has picked Group Love as an underrated band. And we've each created a 10-track playlist to try and see if we can convince each other that we're right. I have done Group Love as underrated and Babs has done... Queens of the Stone Age as overrated. So let's kick off with them. Overrated. So Queens of the Stone Age, officially the band I listen to the most on Spotify. So obviously I am going to be defending Queens of the Stone Age and arguing that they are not overrated. Obviously, they're known for being this kind of stoner desert rock, although I saw that they were also called robot rock, which really surprised me. Um, and when you go on their Wikipedia, the way that they kind of market them, it's known for their blues, kraut rock and electronica influence style of riff oriented and rhythmic hard rock music, coupled with Om's di- Om, Josh Omi, I think it's meant to be Josh Omi, I call him Josh Om, anyway, coupled with Om's distinct falsetto vocals and unorthodox guitar scale. So fucking a lot going on there they are obviously quite a popular band um constantly shifting lots of contributors some famous you know some not so famous uh but i've got to shout out to to tim tim van hamel from the belgian band millionaire who played on eagles of death metal josh om's other band and uh josh om produced his second album so you know me if i can get a belgian reference in i'm getting that belgian reference in they obviously formed from the ashes of Caius, which uh, was a band that formed in Palm Desert, California, and were part of the Palm Desert scene, as they called it. And lots of people from Caius, you know, went on to collaborate with Queens of the Stone Age or create a million other bands. Like literally, my notes for this are ridiculous. There's there's a lot of bands. There's a lot of people. Why do I like them so much? Um, they came into my life, I guess, when I was starting to get more interested in rock. So the first record of theirs that I was really aware of was Songs for the Deaf in 2002. I think that was their breakthrough one, their their third album. And until Era Vulgaris, two albums later in 2007, they were kind of a constant soundtrack. And, you know, the next album they released was um, six years later in 2013, but I still kind of continued listening to Queens of the Stone Age, went back to listen to Rated R in their debut album, and just huge fan, huge, huge fan. You know, it's it did surprise me that they were my most listened to band on Spotify, but I guess it's a bit like Blood Red Shoes, who we've mentioned before. They're the kind of band that when I when I start listening to one of their albums, I'll very often just go and listen to the, all, all their back catalogue. So I am, yeah, very much ready to kind of um, prepare to defend them. But I have to say, in 2013, when Like Clockwork came out, I was qu- quite disappointed. And I was already prepared to be disappointed by Villains, the, the, the latest album in 2017. And in the 10 track playlist I created for Fran, there's only one song from, from those two albums, but I thought, you know, let's go and listen to those two albums as a whole um, for the first time in ages. And I was, actually enjoyed it more than I thought. Um, definitely very nostalgic, I guess, because they now are quite <laughs> old and, you know, time, what is time, an abstract concept in this pandemic world. So even, even the albums of theirs that I don't like, I, I, still, I still enjoy. I think I enjoy them because they obviously blend a lot of genres. Josh Um is a really distinctive frontman with a very distinct voice. I love the falsetto. 
he does seem like a prick, as do a lot of other people involved in Queens of the Stone Age, especially Nick Oliveri and Jesse Hughes. There's a lot of toxic masculinity, which really makes me bleh. So, you know, about the name, they said, oh, it's Queens of the Stone Age because kings would be too macho. Okay, great. But then he says, rock should be heavy enough for the boys and sweet enough for the girls. Ugh, boring. Come on, move on. So definitely in that category of band where they are a massive band. Lots of people like them. I wish I didn't like them as much, but I, 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 I love them. And I don't think they're overrated. They are a big band. But what they're doing is quite unique and they occupy quite a unique space in in rock and throughout the years their sound is quite distinctly queens of the stone age and there's lots of flourishes that you know link them to that but they've they're constantly innovating you know their last album was produced by mark ronson so i wanted to give you fran kind of a playlist of maybe lesser known queen lesser known queens of the stone age songs because i didn't know how much you knew them or liked them i knew that you thought they were overrated so i already knew we were kind of starting on a bad foot and because they have the heavier sound which i know you don't always like i i also try to kind of have a bit of variety but yeah what's your relationship with queens of the stone age so they're a band that i feel like i should know more music than i do and listen to these i had not i had not heard of any of these songs apart from maybe sick 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 yeah i knew that he was in caius previously but i didn't know that he had been in a band like over 30 years and started ridiculously young like he was a teenager when he was already in caius i believe um so that's pretty cool and i, I think maybe i remember them coming out during rated r mainly because in the enemy you had lots of pictures of a naked nick on a bit of a paint base which you're gonna notice something really and obviously he was like kind of like the cool ginger elvis hair Black yeah, I, I just want to interrupt to say that I had a poster of of topless Nick Oliveri on my wall when I was a teenager. Yeah, that, and they, I, for some reason, I'm I, I kind of try and move myself away from bands who think they're cool. I always preferred the weirdos. So the fact that he was in leather jacket in songs they mentioned drugs, wow, guys! <gasps> so that kind of put me drugs. off. Obviously, I loved you know, no one knows and go with the flow because they're just great radio friendly tracks i never i'm surprised i never really listened to songs of the dead because i like mark lanigan i like david Grohl, so i don't mind i really listen to the album I, I really on on kind of analyzing queens of the stone age in this way i realized that probably since i'm like big clay maybe you can you can argue with me on this but i think not since nirvana have they made such a heavy sound so mainstream as they did with songs of the Deaf. Uh, Rated R passed me by because I was too young. That was 2000, so I was still 13 and not, not into that. And I guess you kind of had to be into music to know them, whereas Songs of the Death, like the video was on MTV all the time and stuff like that. And it's heavy shit. <laughs> like, it really is heavy, heavy guitar riffs in an era where the guitar sound isn't as popular as it was in the late 90s and as it will be in the mid noughties. See, I don't know, because I think in 2002, Linkin Park and Limp Bizkit were still big True. bands. But and that, there's a lot of American metal stroke rock was kind of quite popular in those times. But I guess that's more like, you know, with Linkin Park and Limp Bizkit, there was the rap element, I guess, and sort of synthies where, the synth, synthies, synths. <laughs> um, whereas with Queens of the Stone Age, on listening to them, I realised that they definitely love to occasionally use an odd instrument or percussion thing to to make a song stand out but it is mostly guitar bass drums and harmonies i think they do enough radio friendly hits to keep themselves up there so for every sort of like meandering seven minute stoner prog rock song you have little sister they always just did enough just to have that occasional song in the mainstream keep from going mm -hmm. so i think i think i don't know if it's on purpose but i think they're quite clever um, I wouldn't be able to pick a single from the last two albums, but like from the from in the noughties, it always seemed to have like that one sort of song. Which even if I didn't try to, I was aware of, of its you know, of it being around, like Six Sick Thick and the yeah, Little Sister, for example. So yeah, that's why I I knew the big hitters. I think I've been put off because he does come across as a bit of a prick. And um, for me, I kind of like a band who, like I said before, misfits are oddballs and. I think they feel that they're a bit too cool themselves. I, I would agree that that's the vibe that they give. I think that when you when you listen to their music, like they're definitely influenced by a lot of random shit. And I mean, one of the songs on this uh, playlist is a cover, 
And I, I think it's quite an unexpected cover for, for them to be doing, I think. But yeah, maybe maybe we should get into the playlist. So I am biased uh, in this list. So Lullabies to Paralyze is my favorite album. And there's three tracks from that that we'll get into. For the rest, I've tried to kind of be broad. So I've included one song from their debut, Queens of the Stone Age, which is If Only. So it's not the most famous song. The most famous song is Regular John. Do you know that song, Fran? I never heard it before my life until about a few months ago. So yeah, I do like that song. Yeah, it, it's it's a good song and a, and a good album. And famously, Skepta sampled it in, in one of his oh, songs, really? which is really good. Uh, it, Man, Man by Stormzy, I, I really recommend it. He, he, does a, he does a really good job. But I thought, yeah, there was a chance that you might know Regular John. So I've gone for If Only... I really like the falsetto chorus, you know, really setting out Josh Ohm's kind of unique voice. It brings in each instrument one by one. So it's like, you know, guitar and then a bass and then drums and then his uh, his voice. And um, while it might have a more conventional time signature than one or two of the other picks today, the, the way that the chorus is, so it's in 4-4, four, four, but the way that the chorus comes across is, is, is kind of like disjointed as if it's in 3-4 and 5-4. So I... I really like how it kind of constantly wrong fits you. I was going to say, but this is a perfect introduction to Queens of the Stone Age. And I can imagine when they're playing live, this would be the opening track because of the way that it does introduce each member of the band as it goes along. And it has the trademark sounds, which they sort of like have been using throughout. Although it's not as uh, glossy as the future albums, you can kind of hear the genesis of what would become that sound later on so yeah it's a perfect opening track for the podcast and yeah <laughs> I, I I I enjoyed it I think it, I, I literally had never heard of I thought the first album was rated R because working in the music shop that was we never had this um this album and it, I just, it's got an album cover I wouldn't forget oh of course <laughs> not of course not <laughs> yeah so it, it took me quite a while to get into their debut album it was, you know, sometimes when you really like a band and you're really keen on, yeah, in, in my case, Rated R, Songs for the Deaf and Lullabies to Paralyze. I was just like, oh, but, you know, uh, am I going to be burned? But, uh, but reg- I mean, Regular John is the one that opens the album. And that is actually also quite a good intro because you're, you're, you're very intrigued. But yeah, I am bowled over by the compliments that you that you like the opening track to the playlist. What a, what a refreshing change <laughs> from some other episodes. <laughs> Would you not think that regular John is very similar to Feel Good Hit for Summer? I think has sonically, it's almost yin yang. I think it could easily be the predecessor, like they use that event for, oh, we can use that style event in previous slightly. Because it's got a very similar vibe. Not re- I find that Feel Good Hit for the Summer, of the Summer, Feel Good Hit, feel good hit of the Summer is very one notey, right? Literally, I mean, it's like down, down, out, down, out, down. And I mean, okay, apart from the where it kind of builds, whereas regular John, because you have the guitar going, I hope that sounds good coming through your headphones. <laughs> she, guys, she's, she's available yeah. for yeah. any uh, regular <laughs> podcasts. Uh, y- y- it's really unusual. And you're like, where is this going? And then, you know, then another guitar comes in at quite early on to kind of battle it, whereas Feel Good Hits in the Summer is a bass and drums, right? So it's, I mean, yes, it is a similar vibe of, it starts you're confused and then suddenly it kind of hits you. Yes, for sure. Mm. But I would say it's not as commercial as Feel Good Hit of the Summer, which definitely, despite being a hard rock song, is definitely a radio song. But the next one is absolutely not <laughs> a radio song. So my, my next pick is the live version of I Think I Lost My Headache, which on the Spotify list is from the live album Over the Years and Through the Woods. But the original is from from Rated R. So, did you know this song, Fran, because you knew Rated R or not? No, I had never heard a song in my life. It's a mad old song, right? Yeah, yeah. But although it's got all of the uh, the Josh Homie, is it Homie? I, I, I think right. I think it's Omi. But Omi. because man is Om in French, I can't help but say Om. So, write <laughs> write in and let us know, okay? <laughs> I mean, he likes his sort of like flangey fiddle fiddly guitar noise doesn't oh, yeah. he that's that's his style he likes to add some bits and then and he also likes to sliding down the guitar string like mm-hmm. i can make nice audio uh, beautiful well. beautiful thank you <laughs> and this is all about that this showcase all of his um guitar techniques he enjoys yeah. 
and his, his tone and vocal style. Like sometimes I prefer him when he uses his, his higher register. Like I like his falsetto. He's great. His, his falsetto is amazing. And he needs to use it more. And yeah, in this track, of this live, it is like him sort of like singing like, yeah, I'm your ass, ah, you know? so cool. <laughs> Yeah, he does, and I, yeah, and I prefer him when he does try and you know, sing in a different style. And yeah, but, but this goes on for what quite a while, isn't it? It's, it's, I guess it's, I've not heard the original I, version. I was going to ask same... you. Yeah, so it is, it is similar to the original, but in the original, the end doesn't speed up. So okay. because it doesn't speed up, it's a very different experience actually because it's a bit like what is it um i want you she's so heavy by the beatles or something like that where it just keeps repeating and repeating and repeating and you don't know where it's when it's going to end whereas here like okay it, it speeds up and you don't know when it's going to end but when it starts speeding up you know you know you're near the end but yeah i i chose it precisely as the contrast for feel good hit for the summer because it's from the same album and could not be more different in style. It's in 15-8. <laughs> the intro is in 15-8 and the verses are 4-4. Four, four. So, you know, definitely unusual time signature. Yeah, I was I was on like a, I don't know if it was a Reddit or a wiki thing of like, Queens of the Stone Age song by time signatures and actually more in 4-4 four, four than I thought. But yeah, this one was like the legendary in 15-8. So there we go. Was the drama different from the first two albums? Yes. So this is this is where I will have to go and look things up. But Dave Grohl guested on Songs for the Death. And and mm. Queens of the Stone Age is constantly revolving. So actually, probably there might be people shouting into the microphone saying, that's not Josh Om's guitar sounds. It's probably it's someone else's guitar sounds. It could well be because they have so many collaborators. And yes, Josh is the the main person, but for sure there will be contributions from other people on this and and probably from old Caius members, but my love for Queens of the Stone Age doesn't go that nerdy, I would say. So, um, so yeah, but I, I think it was Dave Grohl for Songs for the Deaf, which was different from, from on the first album. What I have noticed is that if you became a member of Queens of the Stone Age, you should not get a mortgage because you have no idea how long you're going to be in that band for. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, that's why I included a non-Queens of the Stone Age song as well, which we'll come to later because, yeah, I think Josh Om is one of those people a bit like Jack White, um or or dave Grohl, who just loves a project loves a side project does a lot of different things but um but yeah well i read that his idol back in palm springs told him that a good artist should be a snake and constantly sh shedding your skin and that's why he's always wanting to do new things and testing himself so it's probably a reason. Yeah, that's a good thing yeah no he, like i said you know at the beginning i think you know, you've talked about this before, you know, when you listen to a song, does it sound like a Queens of the Stone Age song? Very often, yes, but they are they are quite different. And yeah, I think we definitely need to chat about the later albums and how that sound differs as well. But in the meantime, I'm staying in the, in the 2000s with a cover version. So I have to say, Fran, I picked this because of you, because it's a cover of an 80s, uh, it's a cover of an 80s song, Never Say Never, original by Romeo Void. So I did pick it for you, but I, I picked it also because I thought it was an unusual song to, to cover. Mm -hmm. Also, you know, in the original, it's a, it's a woman singing. Here it's Josh Om. And um, I think a bit like the original, the original is is a weird song. You know, I've, I've got it written down. The, the original song is driven by a throbbing, funky bass line and punctuated by jagged guitar and saxophone incorporating post-punk influences. Like change a few words and it could be Queens of the Stone Age. Um, I really like the very loose way he's singing this. You know, the chorus is, I might like you better if we slept together. And it's just like, yeah, I'm, I'm convinced. I don't want to be convinced, but damn it, Josh, you've convinced me. And I like what they've done with the song as well. I literally was writing whilst I was listening to this. Oh, here we go. Josh is thinking about sex again. Oh, just and, really you know, Sex and drugs. Oh, wait it. And then I literally, last minute, realised it was a cover song and it wasn't even his lyrics. So I thought, oh, shit. <laughs> I take it back. I take it back. And wasn't the original um, a lady yeah. singing it, is it? Yeah, so okay, it's, it's quite different yeah. from a male perspective. But I mean, they do it like any other Queen of Stone song. This would fit with any album. You would not think, oh, this is the cover. This, this is why I did it because it, it, it sounds just like a song which would fit on that album, I think, personally. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I, I, I enjoyed it. I had never heard of the, um, the original. Album, like, and I'm, a big, I'm shocked. Yeah, I'm a big. I'm a big new waver. It's it's a recent one for me. It's definitely one that I discovered because of Spotify, probably from an alternative 80s playlist. I, I think they, they have a few other covers as well. You know, they have a Kinks one and, and stuff like that. I think all of their covers are good. And as you say, make 
the song sound like a Queen is, Queens of the Stone Age song? I just think that it could have been a bit shorter. I think Queen of the Stone Age are best when they, I'll talk about this later on, when they get in, do the riffs, thunder drums, and then get the fuck out. Okay. <laughs> and this goes on for like four and a half minutes, and it's like, I think after two minutes, you, you get the idea. Mm. Although, I mean, obviously it's a cover version and you can do what you want, but I would guess it's similar length to the original. So maybe that's why, but uh, but yeah, I mean, for sure, you can you can change it around. But originally you've had more sax. The, you know, in the 80s, you had to have at least a minute long sax solo. <laughs> Over underrated. Sous évalué. Il va so we are moving on to Song for the Dead. So um, this is the only one that I put from Songs for the Dead, not because I don't like the album, but because you've already mentioned two of the main songs from there, Go With The Flow and No One Knows. Now, this song for me has one of the greatest intros of all time. I am not good at drums in the slightest. This intro wants me to play drums, get some repetitive guitar to uh, join me on the, like I always drum along to it very badly when I'm listening to it. It's got really nice booming vocals and harmonies. Mark Lanigan sneering away, brilliant. Has some kind of, is it a theremin or something synthy, which gives it this kind of spooky element to kind of bolster the um, most of the vocals. It's called Song for the Dead, right? So there we go. I think they've thrown everything but the kitchen sink at it and it works amazingly. See, I am embarrassed to have never known that Mark Lanigan was a vocalist. Mm-hmm. Yep. And I heard this before and I didn't, I thought it was Josh just putting on a different voice. I literally had no idea. <laughs> and I've seen, I've seen Mark Lanigan live. So I feel a bit embarrassed. But it's interesting. And I found it really hard to work out, like doing research, who was playing and who was singing what. And to make it even more confusing, sometimes Mark would, would write the lyrics, but not sing the vocal. This is even more annoying when trying to work out who's singing. Mm-hmm. I assume this is Dave Brawl playing drums. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, this, I mean, this is the perfect track for that album. Because yeah. it's like, hey guys, I've got some cool guys and they can do this. I'm very often quite late to notice drums. Like I, I feel like I only notice them when... Yeah, they're really they're really boring or they're really spectacular. But but this song, like if if you want to advertise, you know, if you really want, I don't know, your kid to play the drums or something like that, play them this song because it just sounds absolutely epic, I think. It's so tight. It's it's yeah, it's so controlled, but then yeah, they absolutely lose their shit going into it. It's it's really, really good. And it is a fan favorite. I, I have seen Queens of the Stone Age live at a mm. festival. I'm trying to remember which festival. I think it might have been Verkta in 2008. They were good, but I got into an argument with a Kiwi guy because he was being a twat. And that unfortunately shades my memory of it a little bit. There was just this very drunk guy and we ended up shouting at each other. And um, my memory as well is that they played songs very close to what they were on the record, which if you listen to over the years and and through the woods, the the live album that um, I think I lost my headache was from, you know, you see that they don't always do that. So I would love to see them, you know, in a, in a, in a gig capacity rather than a concert capacity so yeah but i guess at festivals bands are going to be playing to none fans mm-hmm. so they kind of feel like they can't be you know but there's ways possible. you know like subways and muse i saw at reading 06 and they were absolutely fantastic and okay muse were headliners but subways weren't and they absolutely gave it everything and they were playing in the middle of the day um so i get that you might not want to go too crazy but i think you can you know, you can go a bit, a bit wilder. And do you feel this, that very often I feel American bands are worse at festivals for that than British bands? Because, yeah, Kings of Leon, my God, they were the... I really enjoy Kings of Leon's uh, first three albums. And I was so disappointed when I saw them live because they were just mute. <laughs> and and Stan, Stanley, I like playing the songs as on the record, no interaction, nothing. Um, and yeah, is it... You know, is it just my prejudice? But I, I do wonder if it's American bands where festivals aren't so much a thing, I guess, unless you live in California and go to somewhere like Coachella. I don't know. That that was that was my feeling. I mean, I've seen the Foo Fighters at a festival and they're pretty perfect at doing that. I'm not a big fan of Foo Fighters, so... But, but on yeah. a festival, they know how to play a big place. Like Dave will get every single person involved in that song. So he's pretty mm-hmm. good at doing it. But so was your hatred about Kiwi the reason why you still hate Credit House? Is that the link? 
<laughs> no. <laughs> no, because I like Lady Hawk, remember? <laughs> yeah, interesting. Um, I imagine that because this song has lots of false endings, that is yeah. interesting. You can spot the real fans at a festival. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. They're going to start clapping and you're like, oh, guys. <laughs> so, no, I, again, I'm a fan of this track. Doing well. Well, let's see what happens with the next one. So, as I said, this, you know, Song for the Dead is a fan favourite. The next one, I think, isn't, but is is one of my favourites. It clocks in at 154. It's Medication from Lullabies to Paralyze. I, again, speaking of kind of false, maybe not false endings, but false directions, there's a lot of chords going on. It's 1 minute 54, but they pack a lot in. And I, I really enjoy that, and I, I really enjoy his falsetto. What did you think? So is this Lanigan or, or home, Homie? No, I think this is Josh on. Yeah, I don't think Lanigan's there. Let me let me look it up while you talk to me, and then I can uh, <laughs> confirm because, later. Because I was a, I was shocked that this was not a single. Because this is yeah. this is brilliant. Like it's literally like a batting ram. It comes in. It's got a great riff, great chorus, really accessible. Um, yeah, I I I don't know why this wasn't put up put it up after Little Sister. I think I'm confused because I read that Lanigan wrote the lyrics. That's why I see me saying it. Ah, okay. Uh, I'm 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 looking. Oh, here we go. I found I found a Reddit for Queens of the Stone Age. Yeah, I feel like this is the true opening to Lullabies to Paradise. I agree because I'm I'm not a big fan of this. Yeah, do you know this lullaby which starts with Mark Lanigan singing? And it's a very down tempo song. Okay. Okay, lots of people quoting the lyrics is that. <laughs> this is what's going on in this Reddit thread. <laughs> so I'm not going to get much more. Yeah, no, but I think it is Josh. I think you can hear him. Like, it, it's funny that you say that you can't recognize his voice. I feel like I cat what she says, setting herself up for a fall. <laughs> uh, this this sounds like Josh to me. I think, but probably because, you know, when you listen to the album, the first song is Mark Hannigan. It's this lullaby. It's very down tempo moody. Yeah, I, I think it is him. And but maybe write the lyrics. And Nick used to also sing as well previously. Yes. But these yes, days, is it just Josh across the board? Is it? Um, I know. I think on Lullabies to Paralyze, there was still Nick on very Oh God. I think he, oh, maybe... he, he got sacked between the those albums. On the no, he did. Yeah, you're right. But maybe they'd recorded something because yeah. And actually, I was reading about how he got sacked in 2004. Right. So this was released in 2005. Let's see. Here's one of the first. Uh... Rock stars doing a bit of a wife beating before that came. Uh, no, he wasn't. He was just one of the first to get called oh, out fun, for yeah, it. Get for, yeah, yeah, yeah. So now, like now, you hear about it all the time. But back then, I was like, oh my god. That's- yeah, but I, I did always wonder. I, you know, on the one hand, I was like, okay, good, <laughs> good. Um, but then when you when you read about it, he's like, yeah, it's just because I didn't like Brody Dahl, and it's like, well. I don't know, but I I think it's it's a good standard to set. And you know, you see what's going on with Marilyn Manson at the moment, and even with like yeah, on a on a lesser level, Joss Sweden. And it's like yeah, if, if you don't call people up, they're gonna keep doing it. So, so yeah. But I mean, at the same time, I you know, I called Josh. I'm a bit of a prick because I mean, I'm not I'm not accusing him of anything like that. But there was a situation where he kicked the photographer in the face, and there's um I think it's on over the years and through the woods. There's a a track where he's like singling someone out in the audience and he's saying, are you a cock smoker, a cock smoker? And in, in a way that feels incredibly homophobic, but he's very confusing because I don't know if you know this Fran, but he was in a Portlandia sketch with a comedian, Nick Swardson, where they play a gay couple. And I was like that, I would not expect any of this from Josh. Jake Shears from the Scissor Sisters was a guest on two of the uh, last Desert Sessions tracks. So, and, and Elton John was on um, like clockwork because apparently Elton John <laughs> called, called them up and was like, you say you're called Queens of the Stone Age, but you've never had a queen on. And so basically I think invited himself onto the album. So in conclusion, confusion, you know, probably toxic masculinity, but also maybe maturing a bit finally. Well, I mean, with Nick as well, these are probably two guys who grew up in the eighties when rock stars were walking around with a, a bottle of Jack Daniels on one side with a girl on the other side you know that was what a lot of people thought a rock star was mm-hmm. and I think there's a hangover in the noughties of people who still think that is what you have to be to be a rock mm-hmm. star which I think is now changing so these guys grew up in a different era and you know it takes a while I guess for them to realize that you can't be a prick I mean, for that long maybe. this goes back to kind of what we discussed in um in the hair metal episode I think on the one hand, yes, but on the other hand, I think it's a very convenient excuse because there's plenty of people who grow up in other areas and aren't cunts. <laughs> so I, I think if you are in 
a situation where that's encouraged, sure. Uh, you know, I've I've talked I've talked to men. I've talked to a few men. I know I know it's difficult to to be a man as well. And you know, just like some women are scared of men, some men are scared of other men as well, and have to prove that they're manly and not gay and all that kind of stuff. But I think the the whole cock smoker thing really put me off, Josh. Um. For a while. I think the first time I heard that I was like oh okay like you know it's it's uh it's not so recent but still I'm just like it, it's a choice you know it's a choice that you make and again it goes back to are people calling you out on it because now if you did something like that you would get called out on it and that's why you wouldn't do it maybe rather than it's not actually what you think so uh but yeah but yeah so medication that you like I'm amazed it's yeah from lullabies to paradise and I've got two other songs from there the next one very different it's called i never came shout out to my mom who loved this song i think it's probably probably the only queens of the stone age song that she liked she probably would have thought that they were too macho exactly i think this is a totally different side to the usual queens of the stone age which is why i included it it's a slower rock song but it's a good one as i've mentioned many times i think they're rare i think the way josh is harmonizing with himself is beautiful it reminds me of one of my favorite bands to do that which is the vines where craig nichols often harmonizes with himself I have no idea what the lyrics are about, but it seems meaningful. It seems vulnerable. Like, you know, he, I think it is Josh at his most vulnerable. The falsettos are so high and he's so kind of exposed because there aren't the big thrashy guitars and drums coming in. But yeah, what did you think? Well, I was actually going to ask a question, so I'm sad you don't know the answer. Because it seems, he seems to be singing at somebody. And I thought, is this Mm. at Nick or is this an ex-girlfriend? Because he is singing about, some of them has passed, maybe hurting him a little bit. So I wondered if that was either a band member or... Yeah, exactly. It could be a character, right? So you don't know. I mean, my mind, obviously, it's called I Never Came. So I think when when you first see the title, like, here we go. Mm. Here's Queens of the Stone Age being sexy, sexy. And he's, like, talking about, you know, someone not satisfying him. But, um, but yeah, from the lyrics, I couldn't tell. Again, if you can send us a link to Reddit or <laughs> the Queens of the Stone Age Wikipedia, <laughs> please do, guys. And I mentioned before, mm-hmm. like I prefer him when he does sing in his high register. This is why this, this works for me. And um, yeah, I, 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 in my head, I assume that Songs of the Death is it Songs for the Death or Songs from the Dead. I can't so the, it's Songs for the Death, but what's confusing is that the song that I put on is called Song for the Dead. Cheers, Josh. <laughs> um, so <laughs> <laughs> songs I assumed mm-hmm. was their like their their best album, just because the album everyone bought, but. Checking the internet and using my own ears, it turns out that this is probably the best album, yeah? Oh, yes, I think it's the best album. Uh, well, I, okay, I think it's their best album tied with Rated R for me. Oh, really? I, 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 if I had to pick, I would pick Lullabies to Paralyze because listen to it when it came out, if that makes sense. So I had Songs for the Death. It was really good. And then this came out and I was like, whoa, they're even better now. So I just had, you know, immediately a very good relationship to the album. Whereas Rated R was something I had to come to later. So I, I enjoyed it, but it, it didn't feel like as much of a, a surprise discovery as otherwise to Paralyze. Um, but yes, I agree with you. Because um, I, I read that he said he didn't want to do a sequel to, to songs no, for death. Mm-hmm. But it's kind of still does feel the same vein there's not a massive departure there's no like you know jazz solos it's still pretty much rock and roll with some dark elements and some fancy and some cool little riffs happening yeah yeah I, i'd agree that it's it's the sequel i guess have you listened to songs for the deaf in its entirety with all the radio bits no i, I remember i remember the radio bits because i remember it, it playing um isn't it some sort of like concept album that album like a journey, a journey? i think so like because they I think in every song they have fake radio stations mm. playing and, you know, like sometimes it'll be in Spanish or, you know, the opening song, it's like songs for the death. You can't even hear it. And if you, there's like a secret track, if you rewind the album uh, called like real song for the, for the death. So yeah, they're definitely tinkering around in a way that they're not tinkering with this one. This one mm. is, is more straightforward, but I, I really enjoyed the variety on on this one, uh, and especially yeah, the next song, which I'm if I had to guess, would I would guess would be your least favorite, "Skin on Skin." <laughs> okay, right. I could barely finish this song. As a rule, when finish I finish is a funny word to say. For this song. <laughs> when I get a playlist, I try and listen to it at least three times because obviously sometimes it takes a couple of tracks to you know, to settle. And I I just said this is maybe the best album. But this is not going to be up there. Come on, like it, it, I, I, it just sounds like it's at the wrong speed. 
Like it's like he's doing uh, a piss take vocal with the. Uh, it sounds like someone sort of doing like a typewriter sort of goes. And then Joss is going. You're ruining it. And then Joss goes. And I'm like, okay. This is the burst, yeah. So in a minute, it's going to be something like a riff's going to happen, some drums, a, a great chorus. Oh no, that's going to be it for the entire song. I mean, I haven't got to the end yet. Maybe there's something amazing. <laughs> is there? Uh, no, you don't. Well, yeah, I think basically, let's say at the end, he finishes. So you don't need Beautiful. to go there. Uh, yeah, I I put this song on there for me, not for you. And I guess that you, I mean, I didn't think you'd hate it that much, but um, uh you know, I wanted to put it on because it, it's one of my favorites. So I, I wrote, guess this might be a bit too sexy for you. I I really like the dirty guitars. Like the the guitars going down, 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 down. I, I really like it. I like the, I don't know what the name is. What's the, the, the thing that they also use in Little Sister, the, the thing that drummers hit to keep time. Because it, it's not a camel that they're using, but yeah, like, yeah, again, drummers right in. Like a hi hat. No, it, it's it's not the hi hat. It's like it, it almost. I mean, it could be actually castanets or something like that. There's there's something that sounds like that in the background, which again kind of really makes it weird for me. He's moaning in the background, and I love a rock song where men are moaning because guess what? I'm a heterosexual woman. I appreciate that. Fine, you can have. Yeah, all she wants is from Duran Duran. You can have all your women moaning, Pink Grease. That's fine. But thank you. Can we have some more men moaning as well? Because that personally is what I find sexy. And I find this song very dirty, very sexy. It's uh, it's really good. And it's, I mean, I say, that's why I was saying that you were ruining it by, no, I'm talking about a typewriter. I'm now going to listen to it. And I'm going to imagine, unfortunately, rather than, you know, like Josh being all snarly and sexy, typing away on a little uh, typewriter, but um, yeah, I really like the way that he uses the the vocals as well, because there's a lot of uh, uh, you know, and um, and and he also goes very high and very low. So so there we go. We but we I, can move on. <laughs> I also am not a fan of All She Wants by Duran Duran. I, I actually I actually like All She Wants yeah. is by Duran Duran. That's that's fine, but yeah. Yeah, the moans get a bit too much, and I'm a heterosexual guy. No, I don't no. find female moans that are appealing in, in audio tracks. No more moans, guys. But how about moan, moan, I want moan, moan, moan? Um, how please. about some sick, sick, sick? <laughs> so sick, sick, sick. So this song for I think about three weeks when I was doing my finals of my third year at university, and therefore you know my my mental headspace was not great. All I listened to on the bus from my student house into campus to go to the library was sick, 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 and. Let's make out by Does It Offend You? Yeah, on repeat. I, I don't know why. I, I had an iPod. I had other songs from the albums that that comes on, but I, I, it was something getting me through. I have no idea. So, Sick, Sick, Sick is probably one of the songs I've heard the most in my life because, yeah, it was it was on on repeat in two thousand and eight when I was when I was trying to do it. And I think you know another sexy song. Um, do you did you read up on this song and and see who's on backing vocals and synth guitar, Fran? I haven't, but I'm about to find out. Uh, you want to take a guess? Can you, you? You didn't hear? No, you didn't so hear. Not to 2007. Yeah. Backing vocals. I mean, I've, I've heard the song. I'm about to say, like, this is probably the, the last Green and Sonia song I remember coming out being played mm-hmm. on the radio. On the radio. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I haven't even noticed the backing vocals. The answer is Julian Casablancas. So oh, if you, if you go back and listen at the end, you can hear him. You, at the end, you can hear him doing backing vocals. And I also, I always thought he just did the backing vocals, but turns out he was on synth guitar as well. I like all the scars and all the guitars going on. I could read out the lyrics, but I think you'd blush. Uh, but, it, you know, basically it's about oral sex. It seems quite favorable favorable to women. Great. Again, more of that, more of that Queens of the Stone Age. Um, but no, this, the, actually for this one, I have to say, I think the sexiness is maybe, yeah, tertiary i i really like the music i really like the guitars um the contrast of the the kind of <laughs> it's gonna say pulsating but now everything sounds dirty like the very uh <laughs> what's another word for it um repetitive verses versus the chorus which kind of goes down and down, 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 up and down and and they're kind of a bit higher and and the guitar side are in the middle do you think that he can still be writing about sex in the 50s, in the 50s. Yeah. You, know, you, think, you think that there's no limit on talking about oh, both? Oh, go for it. Really? 
yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, at least I hope I'm, I hope I'm still having sex in my fifties. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Yeah, and I think especially from you know from men, you're kind of used to it, right? Like Rolling Stones are still trotting out their their songs. I can believe it. I mean. I think he talks about perhaps like a little girl or something like that, which is always, I'm always a bit like, ugh, when, mm. when musicians mention that, but no, what does he say? Uh, yeah, I can read out a bit. A lick of the lips, a grip on your hips, beg on a knee, pout your bottom lip while cracking the whip. Yeah, sure. I can see him doing that. So, so yeah, yeah, I, I can believe it. He's, he's, he's a sexy man. I remember this album divides a lot of people. I mean, the album cover's horrendous, isn't it? It's it's one of those where, a bit like the Bon Jovi that we were talking about, where you're like, guys, like, did you not have better graphic designers? Like, especially after, um, I don't think Lullabies to Paralyze was a great album cover either, but Rated R, like, it was simple but very effective. And Queens of the Stone Age, like, that cue with the sperm, that permeated their videos as well. And their videos mm-hmm. from that era were really good. So, again, it's kind of like the, the branding goes all over. But, yeah, I... It definitely took me a while to get into Era Vulgaris and um, Threes and Sevens. I think I only got into because it was on Rock Band or something. Yeah, 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 yeah. once again. But but Six Six Six, I just yeah, I I like it and listen to it obsessively and do think it's the best song on the album. I think well, I think Threes and Sevens reminded me of a fantastic tune. But yeah, I remember my mates saying that on this album, like he's he's got his money, he's got his fan base. <laughs> And now he's just going to enjoy himself. And apparently it's like, it's kind of a mismatch of like different sounds and trying keyboards and all sorts. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It probably surprised a lot of the fans. But um, was this during when he became like a gun for hire? Because like in that period, he seemed to be in everyone's fans at the same time. Like he was doing Igles of Death Metal, uh, Venom for Convulsions, <laughs> appearing on Biffy Clyro Rap and producing Arctic Monkeys. So maybe yeah. he was kind of like spread too thin during his era. Yeah, yeah, it, it definitely was. Uh, but I mean, even already before, like the, I have a song from the, from the Desert Sessions, which are from 2003. So that was like at the peak of their, of their fame. So may, maybe he wasn't spreading himself too thin because he always has, right? And if mm. you like, if you like songs from, from that era, then you would argue not. Um, but yeah, just maybe the the inspiration wasn't there as much. I guess, you know, in 2005, after Nick Oliveri leaving, that would have been a big break and something to be inspired by. By 2007, was he married to Brody Dahl? Like, you know, again, we talk about it a lot. Rock stars getting married and falling in love, blah. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I mean, but I prefer Era Vulgaris way more than either of their last two albums. Really? Uh, you, uh, yes. you know, I can notice that you didn't mention uh, like clockwork at all on this uh, playlist yeah like clockwork oh that was that was a big disappointment for me um like i said i listened to it again and it was really funny how many songs i knew i was like well clearly i tried <laughs> clearly i tried many many times this album and just it just never clicked i wonder it came out in 2013 which is when i moved to belgium so maybe i don't know because i was in a more transitionary period myself i didn't appreciate queens of the stone age being in one too um but yeah, I, I I wouldn't even know what it was that I don't like about it. Like, is it a bit poppier? Is it's probably a bit less heavy, right? It's a bit less heavy. And on villains, the where I did pick a song, so I picked the evil has landed. That's less heavy, and the that song has it. That song on the album is produced by Mark Ronson, and you can hear it. But that I think was a much better marriage of collaborators. Um, and the evil has landed. I think was one of my top favorite songs in in 2017. And I listened to that over and over again in a similar way to Six Six Six. And I think it really it blends Queens of the Stone Age and Mark Ronson. You know, Queens of the Stone Age guitar sounds, unexpected directions, and his falsetto. But it, it sounds a bit slicker. But I don't hate it. It's it's more stripped back, but it works. Whereas I think for for most of the other songs, I, I think I saved one more song from. So I've got nothing saved from like Clockwork on my Spotify, from Villains. I only had uh, the Evil Has Landed, but I've now also saved Domesticated Animals and Feet Don't Fail Me, because uh, kind of on re-listen, I I realised I like those as well. So yeah, I definitely prefer prefer Villains to to the other. One. But yeah, have you listened to either of them? No, but I on my research, people said that with like Clockwork. Everyone got excited to hear about Elton John and Dave Grohl, and I think it's Nick come back and does a cameo as well. 
Nick Oliveri? No, 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 Nick Oliveri I came, came back. I was like, what? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, that guy, Nick Oliveri. That is not. But, um, <laughs> and people said, but you can't notice that, like, Elton John, he plays mm. on a track which is all guitar, so you can barely hear any piano. And if you've got Elton John, surely you want to hear mm. Elton John be Elton John. And, and everyone mm-hmm. seems to be really confused, like, were they only allowed in the studio for, like, an hour or something? <laughs> like, people were surprised, like, <laughs> yeah, like you can't hear any of the big cameos. And am I right in saying that in villains, there's no big cameos, it's mainly just Josh? I don't think there is many big cameos. Though, again, I, you know, I'll be honest, I, 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 I went into it with trepidation and didn't, didn't do much research on it. So um, I haven't really looked into it. But I, I think what I know is that Mark Ronson produced the yeah. whole album. But I mean, qu- the Queens of the Stone Age lineup right now is more than Josh. So according to Wikipedia, at the moment, it is Josh Om, Troy Van Leuven, Dean Fatita, Michael Schumann, and John Theodore. So again, you know, when we're talking about the guitar sounds and certain things, it isn't it isn't all just Josh, but I don't know how much he's kind of commandeering. But I think he completely wrote all of the last album himself. And usually there was a couple of songs co-written with other members. Uh, and there we go. But what what were the big singles of the last album? Was the Evil has landed a single? I don't even know. I honestly because I I just for my own um <laughs> Where, for my own preservation, again, I'm going on Spotify so I can tell you. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, no, I do remember. It was the way that you used to do, which I, d- I don't like. So when when that came out, I was like, oh, Jesus. And then The Evil Has Landed. So that that was the, the song that, that got me into the album. But yeah, The Way You Used To Do, I think, is the big song from that album. And talking about artwork, this is pretty cool. Yeah, so finally, yeah. we're ending with a, a sneaky uh, track, a non queen the Solo yes. song, which is... So before the record, Fran was already giving out to me for cheating. Uh, and I said, no, let me give my justifications. So obviously, Fran, we've talked about how, in your words, Josh Homme is a gun for hire and he's frequently in other bands, uh, as, as we've mentioned. I feel very justified in picking a Desert Sessions song, especially one from this album, because I want to make it with Chu. Or you is on this album. And then it went on to Era Vulgaris. So that was a song that was recorded in, in Desert Sessions with PJ Harvey that then went on to the main album. So I think Desert Sessions is a bit of a testing ground for, for Josh and for Queens of the Stone Age. And I picked Crawl Home from that session with, with PJ Harvey. I think that's an amazing collaboration. I think they went out, if I remember correctly. And I I, well, like, I remember there were the rumours and I was like, oh, that's so exciting back in whenever it was that I found out. Yeah, this is from 2003. So I, I feel justified because I, I feel like it is showing aside to queens of the stone age because a lot of the people involved in this were then involved in queens of the stone age later and i really like the song the contrast between pj harvey and josh Om, as with this mess i'm in that she does with tom york i really enjoy the fact that she's doing the low and he's doing the high i think this is a classic and yeah i i would prefer this on era vulgaris to i want to make it with you and i have um i have a playlist i have many random playlists I have a playlist called Chasing Time, which is all breakup songs. And I have now added this to, to that because, yeah, it's definitely, definitely an unhappy one. Definitely they're in a, a, in the video, they're arguing in a car in the desert. And uh, yeah, I think it's a great tune. I remember the Desert Sessions coming out and not really knowing what it was about. Like, was it just mm. Josh Holm and guest vocalist or a, a, a proper collaboration? Um, but yeah, mm-hmm. um, PJ always seems to do quite well with the older uh, duets, doesn't she? With uh, Nick Cave as well, mm-hmm. she's done a couple. Yeah, um, yeah. I, uh, she's left uh, the grass of Dorset, gone to gone yes. to the desert of California, and sounds as cool as she could be. And I thought it sounds a little bit like The Kills. Is that fair? Ah, interesting. I, yeah, yeah, I can see that. And I guess it's, yeah, a bit slicker. Does this predate the kills? Yes. So I wonder if they were influenced by... No. no okay, damn it. <laughs> no, this, this one doesn't... Uh, yeah, I mean, I can go and get my CD. I think... Let me check. I think the kills first album was like 2000 or 2002. Oh, no. No, no, yeah. Okay. Potentially, because Keep On Your Mean Side, the kills first album came out in 2003. So they were doing it at the same time. Okay. Although obviously different locations, like Alison Mosshart is from Florida and Jamie Hintz from the UK, I guess London, but I don't know. Uh, we've got a US and UK collaboration, cool sexy vocals. We've got some cool bluesy guitar. It's it's kind of similar, but yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I enjoy this track. So yeah, um, out of the ten tracks, I enjoyed about seven of them. So oh, I'm amazed. 
I, I really thought because, you know, they are a bit heavier um, that you might think that they were, but I guess my strategy of using like less, lesser known songs to surprise you into liking them <laughs> works. I don't, Hooray. I don't mind heavy just as long as there's a decent vocal. I think that's what puts me off is that if it's screaming and shouting. It's it's vocal. It's okay. Vocal. I no, no I'm melodic. happy to listen to a, a, a metal riff and metal drum. That's cool. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a vocal, so this does it for me. That's that stuff. And, so and, interesting. And Joss can sing. So thank you, Joss, for, for not, not screaming like a prick. Over underrated. Sous évalué. Du rochette. Thank you. You have made it to the end of part one. And how nice does that, huh? Like, I was not expecting con to convince Fran at all about Queens of the Stone Age. Um, and I seem to have won him round, and I'm really delighted about that. I think uh, the Crowded House episode, New Zealand, still feels fresh in our minds of, you know, the episode where we almost fell out. So it was very nice to hear him, uh, hear him enjoy Queens of the Stone Age and to, to go through that very, very playlist. Coming up in part two is Group Love. If you know Group Love, you'll know they're a band that mix a lot of genres. They're a bit all over the place. So find out whether I like them by the end or not. Underrated. Welcome back to part two, guys. And we're on to our Android pick, which is my pick, which is Group Love. Have you heard of Group Love before, Babs? I heard of Group Love when, was it a month ago, you sent me a video of theirs, which was like this sort of live compilation um, of them singing, because I know that they're the last band that you saw before coronavirus, correct? That's correct, on March the 4th, and it was at a time when we know it's a, it was a thing, but we're still kind of living in denial. So <laughs> I went to London and just made sure that I was constantly washing my hands and not touching anyone. But uh, yeah, two weeks later, it was yeah. game over, guys. Yeah, so I had never heard of them before you sent me that video. And I'm delighted that we now get to talk about them. So yeah, what's your what's your relationship? How did you hear about them? So it was, <laughs> remember CDs? Remember when the enemy would give away a free CD? Absolutely. I'm pointing at the CDs that are in the background of uh, this Zoom chat right now. Love a CD. Annoys me when bands only release stuff on vinyl. I'm looking at you, Tom Beck, for your latest album. Anyway. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, occasionally um, I'll grab an enemy because it would do like a free CD of like, bands need to hear this year. And Group Love were on the bands need to hear this year, I think in 2010, with Colours, which is off their first EP and their first album. And it stood out like a sore thumb. And I really, I think I, I loved that track. And then because there's such a delay before the debut album came out, and for some reason, the debut album was never in any record stores. So they completely went off my radar into about 2013, when I think on FIFA, one of the tracks was on there. Oh, it's that band from like three years ago. And then, yeah, then they're sort of band mm. who like just, a song would appear on like a film or a TV show. And then um, their third album came out, I think in like 2016. And I was up in London and I, no I just noticed randomly in like Time Out that they're playing the Scala. So I thought, oh yeah, I'll, I'll go and check them out. And I literally knew. Like, oh, Time Out as well. Time yeah. Out, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> podcast. And I knew that it literally like three or four songs. And then they were outstanding. Like, they literally gave one of the best performances. And you know when you don't know the songs, but you love the songs instantly, just because how they're performing it, it was mm -hmm. one of those things. And they um, then did a cover of Sabotage, and both uh, the lead vocalists, uh, Hannah and, and Christian, both jumped into the crowd and had uh, their arms around us singing Sabotage back when you could do that. And it was one of the best concerts of my life. And I remember I went back home and then like, started listening to all the three albums I, I missed out on and then like Ben Love and it turns out they are quite big in America. They have more monthly listens than Queens of the Stone Age there Frank, on Spotify. Yeah, they have six point something million monthly listens, sub, way less um, followers, whereas Queens of the Stone Age have five point something monthly listens, which really surprised me because, yeah, as I said, I, I had not heard of them and it just it keeps happening that you 
you then find out that they've got loads of yeah so they've got 962,000 followers 6.8 million monthly listens so yeah and yeah um one of the members was from london so there was a link although when i went to see him he had already left the band but they have a, a really strange introduction and how they became a group love so mm. so yeah they have a strange beginning so hannah hooper and Chris Zucconi, who were a couple in New York, uh, were both struggling artists. And at the same time, Andrew Wesson, the guitar player, and Ryan Rabin, the drummer, living in California, were invited to a uh, sort of like a, an artist residency in Crete, near Greece. And at the same time, Sean Gadd from London came along, and loads of like artists and musicians sort of went to this uh, house in Crete. And basically lived there and the idea is like you know to, to to explore your art and to meet fellow artists and the five of them like from different backgrounds sort of like formed their own bond and they called themselves the group hence where group love came from they got tattoos of the word group on, on their arms and then after oh god you know, that sounds oh, suffering. hey guys they were young that i think they did a lot of mushrooms and drugs and then they all went to live with ron Rabin in california and they started to do shows. The idea was they're going to record a couple of days in this house. It turned into two weeks of ended mini tours. And before they know it, they were group love. Um, Ryan had been in other bands previously, and he wanted to be a producer. And he then said that he enjoyed the band so much that he went back to being a drummer, and he's an amazing drummer. He's also the son of uh, Trevor Rabin, who was in the band DS, and is an amazing uh, film composer. So uh, he, he had a good that's probably why he was able to have a massive house and to, to live in. <laughs> um, always helps. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. then, yeah, then they did the uh, the EP, which had the song I mentioned earlier, Colours. And then they produced a day album in 2011 called Never Trust a Happy Song. The reason they did that was because they were in California and called Group Love. They were worried people might think they're like a hippie tribute band. That's why they called themselves... Mm-hmm. Never trust a happy okay, song. Okay, I wanted because they thought, <laughs> they they thought we are a bit more no deeper than than yeah, just like uh, you know flowers and, and marijuana. And then yeah, then the mm-hmm. the Debra album came out. It had four singles, including "Tongue Tied," which I think is probably the, the biggest hit. Uh, it features in like mm-hmm. adverts and like yeah, I think yeah on FIFA Twelve as I mentioned as well. And then yeah, then I personally never ever knew this album came out at all and then since then they've released an album called Spreading Rumours the bass player from London on, uh, had to leave for um, drug and uh, alcohol reasons mm. um, so then if, so he, was, he was replaced in, uh, in 2014 and then recently um, Ryan has stepped down as the drummer and producer because I believe he now is in his own um, production company so they've also got a brand new drummer. So there's only three remaining members left. And yeah, they, they've made four albums. The most recent album came out last year called Healer. And I saw them yeah, in London on before they released the album. And yeah, so they've got some great singles. Um, they're amazing live. I'm always a big fan of a um, male and female vocalist. Yeah. yeah, me too. And they just have so much energy. They also, each album is so varied, like they can have a great sort of like rock riff and then they can have like a really poppy keyboard track. So they can, if they can easily surprise people because you can hear one track on the radio and buy the album and go, whoa, this is not the band I expected. So the Christian's got kind of like a grunty sort of like vocalist sort of sound to him. When you go and see them, it has a strange like... Um, audience because it has people who obviously like the pop vendor tracks and then the people who are into like the the riffs and, and, the, and the drums so yeah they are a mismatch but um i think hannah mentioned that they thought of themselves like the spice girls because each member is is so <laughs> different that everyone everyone can remember they can have andrew is like the surfer dude on the on the on the guitar c is like you know okay. c wears like the leopard print onesie and jumps around and gets everyone going kristen's got sort of like like, like kristen's got the uh the grunge look to him um yeah and the, the drum is like an, an awesome cool california drummer yeah everyone brings something to the party obviously now two of his numbers have now left so yeah um I would recommend seeing them live, and I believe that all the tracks sound better in person and on the stage. They're one of the bands when you've got to be watching them 
um, who really get the appeal what group love. Yes. So um, I'm really glad that I'd seen that video of them live before I listened to this playlist, because I think it did shape how I listen to this playlist. And I feel like everything that I say about it, it's with the caveat of, but of course, it's probably quite different live. Yeah, it was such an interesting playlist because what genre are they? You know, like, like you say, it's it's all over the place. Um, and yes, I think you're going to guess which side I fall under in terms of genres. I much preferred the riffs and the drums than the than the pop. But my God, like it's really, it really takes you, every song is completely different. Every song goes in a million different directions. They're, they're such flawed vocalists to me, like, um, but it works somehow. And together it works. And yeah, I mean, from what I read of, uh, I only read a little bit about Group Love because I felt like I'd already seen the video. I didn't want to find out too much, but wasn't it that like he met her in a bar or something? He met her in a bar and she was the one who invited him to the commune, something like yeah. that. Like they weren't, they weren't a couple just, just yet. So it's like very star-crossed lovers sort of thing. And they've been together ever, ever since, which is like, wow, okay, that's, that's pretty amazing. Um, and clearly, you know, the chemistry is there on, on all fronts, but yeah, it was, it was, it was an assault on the senses broadly in a good way. I thought. Yeah. The story goes is that she was a struggling artist in New York and was spending all her time just trying to, to paint something decent. And then just dragged along to go and see a band in the and really didn't want to go there. And it was love at first sight. As soon as, as, as he walked on stage, he went, oh my God, and then waited for him to uh, finish and chatted to him Aww. and he said there's a massive aura and they literally just fell in love and yeah and that was like 13 years ago and now they've got two kids and to be in a band uh-huh. and have two kids for that long is really rare in, in a pop industry you, you've also like i i've always felt like i've never wanted the same job as my partner so like that they must really love each other to spend yeah that much time with each other kind of um and yeah, they, I read that they had to teach her how to sing basically, because it was, it was like, what's the word? Material artist's residence. Like it wasn't musical. Like it was, I think for painting or something. No? Or... Any, any, yeah. I think, I think it said it's any, any art. So music, film, oh, uh, painting. Okay, okay. Yeah. But, I mean, yeah, it's true. Yeah. She plays keyboards on stage, but I think like with, with her, with singles, songs like Remember the Time, that could be a pop song for anyone. I, mean, I don't think her voice is like, you know, it's, it's not like um, Jerry from the Spice Girls. She can, like, she can sing. Yeah, oh no, she she absolutely can sing. Like I would not have guessed that she only learnt how to sing on the on that residency. Um, I wouldn't say that. I, I would say they're fairly matched as vocalists as well. But it's funny that you say grungy for his vocals. I actually got um, well for the first song that you picked. I've put REM mixed with Smashing Pumpkins. There was a he reminded me of Michael Stipe quite a bit. Well, I guess uh, Pumpkins and the, are and, quite grungy. And some songs did. Yeah, yeah, pumpkins, pumpkins are grungy, but yeah, like that—that that was that. Well, that's my comment for the for the first track on your. On your they got compared a lot to the Pixies randomly when they first came out. Male, female, right? Yeah, yeah. I, um, I mean, okay, I guess Pixies also. It, very different songs going in different directions, but Pixies, it's way more traditional kind of guitar based drums, whereas here it's fucking everything and robots and whatnot. So. Uh, yeah, I, I somewhat like like Pixies, but I wouldn't say completely. Okay, so what is your first song from? So I thought I'd trick you, and oh, you did, <laughs> <laughs> and I gave you the most rocky numbers, Borderlands and Aliens, which has one of the best uh, drum patterns. In a, in a, in a, like if you watch them live, literally the sweat pours off Ryan's face although he's now left, but it, it did. Um, and it's got a, a great riff, and it constantly keeps changing all the time. The, the chorus is unexpected, and yeah, and I thought, yeah, if I give you Borderlands and Aliens, you won't be scared off thinking about another crappy pop band. So, <laughs> go for it. 100%, you know me. Uh, yeah, absolutely loved it. What a weird guitar sound. So unusual to, to begin with, and you're like, okay, What's this arpeggio? What's going on? Um, and because it's you, and because I didn't know this band, I wrote, kept getting worried it was going to go poppy, but it didn't. <laughs> um, yeah, amazing drums, amazing vocals. Um, I put that the guitar solos aren't that different from Queens of the Stone Age. There's definitely grunge elements in there. Um, and yeah, me- like metal drums in this, 
song that feels like bubblegum pop but isn't yeah I, I really I was like these guys are geniuses how how are they doing this I don't understand what genre this is or anything so very good first choice I really enjoyed it and like the minute the, the playlist finished I went back and listened to to this one again and I, I listened to it today as well like really good song I'm gonna keep mentioning it but yeah watch him do it live and literally the concentration of those spills um but see, I find it strange because we did a pop episode. So you love pop music. So why is it that if it's a band doing pop music, you get caught up? Mm, it, it's pop rock. Is it? It's pop rock. I, I like pop. Normally the pop that I like is synthy and electronic, let's say. Um, that's why I don't like Busted. That's why I don't like McFly. Um, and all the, so I, I feel like when there's electric guitars, I don't like them to be poppy. I like them to be... Um, riffy and and in in the minor key uh, and yeah i mean I'm, I'm trying to think are there any exceptions to that rule i really don't think they are when i think of who are who are my favorite guitar bands you know it's it's your muses your radioheads your white stripes your vines your hives but how about Dr- how about like duran duran though yeah i guess there's exceptions like rio i like rio and that's definitely kind of more more melodic guitar but my favorite duran duran songs are the grumpy ones like chauffeur and save a prayer uh, and yeah, all she wants is and, and stuff like that. I don't, I don't, I don't like new moon on new moon on Monday. Simon's vocal is a bit poppy, so I don't like it as much. Um, so yeah, I, I think it actually, I probably never thought about it before. I think it is probably guitars doing pop. I'm not a fan of for whatever reason. I don't know why. Let's, let's find out <laughs> which songs you hate. Okay, so <laughs> keeping it kind of rocky and kind of rhythm, yeah we bring out deleter which i fucking adored one of my favorite songs of 2020 which is why i was so fucking disappointed by the album it's on okay because this is by far the best track and uh, it's literally a massive fall down um oh, and I, huh. on, on their on their fourth album um i like two songs and that's the that was a tour i saw premiering songs off the album which was out that, that week and I was going oh maybe this sounds better on CD <laughs> and um, it, it doesn't guys unfortunately mm. and then I found out why because Ryan had quit the band yeah. and he seems to be the guy who was the brains behind him being the, the producer and songwriter and he's written some some big hits for other artists include like do you know um, Walk the Moon? I don't know Walk the Moon like, they're like a big, another, another big American sort of indie pop band. Okay. And I'm kind of thinking, oh, I see the, uh, <laughs> we'll see the brains. And now he's, he's stepped aside. Is it not going to be as great? So, um, yeah, it's called Healer. And yeah, uh, unfortunately, after Deleter and the other track I put on this, it's really not great. So, you know, they may bring in someone greater help them move on to the next phase in their career but i, I really like this? this song as well you, you, i've put that you've added you've chosen a song with weird fucking distorted guitars which i like and the clean drums i like as well and um i wrote that it must be fun to sing along to live uh it went a bit melodic in the bridge especially the vocals there i didn't like it as much but i still overall enjoyed the song yeah it sounds like a new wave banger you'd have yeah. you hear back in 1982 i mean yeah, like instantly, instantly loved it. Um, and then we move on to where it began for me, which is colours, which I have noticed they spell in the UK. I way. didn't even clock that, but you are correct. They do. Yeah. So what does that mean that Sean Gad from London wrote oh. the song on London and refused them to American? It's it? like, oh, it's cooler because it's not American. Yeah. Or, 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 that maybe. or whatever it is. Um so I wrote that I love the album title, so I'm glad that you explained why um, they wrote an album called Never Trust a Happy Song. I like the vocal interplay, again, and the rapid riffs and the, the drums at the end. I, but I left not knowing whether I liked it or disliked it. So I think I need to listen to it again. So it, it, wasn't, it wasn't one of my favourites, but it wasn't one of my least favourites. Like I, there were elements that I liked, but it, yeah, it wasn't as immediate to me as, as the first two songs. But it's definitely interesting. Like when it when it came when it popped on that NME soundtrack, like I thought, oh, this is not you, what, what you expect from NME. Right? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, and, and I loved it, the changes in it and it, it, it caught my interest. So I do I, I am ashamed of myself for never buying their first album. But bringing it back to the most poppy element you could go with Love, 
This is where, see, see, this is kind of electro as well. It's got keyboards on it. So yeah, remember that night. Um, I did not like this at all. Apart from, is, is she repeating? It doesn't matter. There's like a breakdown where, where it changes quite dramatically. And I like that. And I wrote that I didn't like it because to me, it sounds like fun or some other American band who soundtrack alternative films, alternative sitcoms or indie films. That's, that was the vibe that I was getting. It was like, I felt like it was the kind of song that someone who's not very musical is soundtracking their indie film and, and chooses something a bit easy, a bit broad. And yeah, I didn't, I didn't like it. So uh, uh, yeah, sorry, Fran. <laughs> but that is really interesting you said that because one of the reasons they became, I think, big in America was by soundtracking teen films. Well, there we go. And they have a song on, is it The Fault That Lies With The Stars? Yeah, the yeah, paper. so yeah, I'll, I'll, come to, I'll come to that one. But, uh, yeah. but yeah, by the time I came to that, I was like, aha, here we go. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, surely it's not all in my mind. Um, so yeah, this was definitely one of my, my least favourite ones on the list. That is a shame. And Ways to Go, which I believe again was massive in America. And if you can tell, like, if you see the videos on the second album, obviously they got a bigger budget and they got amazing, glossy, funny videos. (laughs) That's a thought, hang on, these guys are not struggling. These guys have got some bugs behind them. And Ways to Go, I think, is a a fantastic pop song. And it's when they have both elements, both um, Hannah and Chris's vocals work great on this track. You probably hate it. No, no, I enjoyed elements of this one. So I enjoyed the synths, especially. Um, I, 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 I now can't, I did listen to this song twice, but it was last night, so I can't remember it. So what, maybe you can decipher what I've written, which is, I like the synths, especially without the main vocals and with the swells. Don't know what that means. I, and the repetition of day at the end is quite hypnotic, but there's something a bit bombastic that didn't sit well with me. Like it is kind of, wear your heart on your sleeve kind of music right and that's just maybe not so much maybe i'm just too cool guys no it's it's not that like i i have just talked in great depth about how five of the best boy band ever yeah so again it's a bit like um what was what was the one where with colors where i liked elements but i don't know if i like the song as a whole and i will need further listening to kind of come with a more final opinion i thought ways to go was too popular for myself when i first heard it and mm-hmm. over time, I now love the little changes as it goes along. It does pick up like little sort of like mini raps mm-hmm. happen, and it does sort of like the the synths get in and out on guitars. It, it does it's it's better than you first think. Um, if, if you do scratch the surface, there's something there. So give it a few more listens and and enjoy the video if mm-hmm. you can. Yeah, yeah. Again, I'm I'm going to repeat because we're I think we're probably halfway through every song that I've I've rated here. It's with the caveat of it probably sounds completely different and probably amazing live. Um, so yeah, I can see that. And then we're back to um, the most recent album with the only other decent song on the album. And <laughs> I, I can't. This song is called Inside Out, and a part mm-hmm. of me thinks it's crap, and a part of me loves right. it. And I haven't decided whether <laughs> I love it or hate it, but I think it's worth. See, but this is that was how I felt about a lot of the songs. So clearly, that's what they do, right? Because they're bringing in so many different things. Yeah, I enjoyed the chorus. Of this song but again i've gone back to fun you know you know the band yeah, fun, yeah, yeah, the yeah. tonight we are young there's something about it that is, that's a bit fun that puts me off so yeah again this was one of my my less favorite ones with this i almost put on a remix i made a remix and i've noticed I love i've noticed that they also love remix and there's like five different versions of a song so you thought too much i can't just pick one Let's go for the, <laughs> <laughs> the main song so yeah they got they got some some edm versions of this but i thought i oh, may hate that more but I just be, I'll, I'll be EDM. How, do, how do I feel about ODM? I, I, it's weird. I feel like it. What do you know? I, I was thinking about this when you said that they they came out in 2010. I've I've said this many times before. 2010 to 2013 were my wilderness years where I didn't really know what was going on in music. So I feel like I wouldn't have maybe been buying the enemies to get the free CDs and stuff like that. Um, and and yeah, maybe there's something about that. Like maybe it's just like it is. Oh no! But actually, hang on. This one's from twenty twenty. But there's there's a few songs with like they're, they're so they're throwing so many different things at it. I don't I don't really know how to feel it. It doesn't anchor itself in something familiar to me, you know, like from from that era. So so yeah, that's fine. I I don't 
I mean, as long as you kind of don't mind. And so I think. Well, yeah, ask, ask me more questions. So we're getting back to the debut album. This is still their best album. If you want to start summer, start with their debut. And we have Tongue Tied, which probably is the most well-known song. And again, it's, it's, it's appeared on like, yeah, FIFA, adverts. It's got a great chorus. Right, it's yeah. got a great chorus, which you tend to not like. So what do you think of Tongue Tied? Um, so I, it sounded really familiar <laughs> when it kicked in and I've written, have I heard this at an indie disco? So the fact that you said FIFA and adverts, that's probably where I heard it rather than an indie disco. I wrote that my feelings changed every five seconds because it went in so many different directions. I preferred her vocals to his. I, I found him very whiny in, in this song. And I also like how she's doing the, the speak singing to accompany him at the end. I really like the bass and synths. But the vocals and the acoustic guitar puts me off. So again, elements, elements. But I, I think with group love, I'm not surprised with so many songs that I only like elements because, because there's so many different things in one song. Yeah, I have tried um, group love on some people, and the first thing people get put off by is his vocal being a bit too whiny mm-hmm. American. Which mm-hmm. I think it's lucky uh, that Han is in the band to sort of mm-hmm. like walk to counter yeah, it, counter yeah. it and water, water it down. I think that helps a lot. So yeah, when I was getting sort of stuck, I thought, well, I've given you the pop songs, I've given you a few big hitters, but where do I go now? And I thought, I thought, let's try a cannonball. Let's try and make it, yes. let's try and make it a bit more rock, rock again. So I thought you may yes. like cannonball. I did like cannonball a lot. Uh, this was my second favorite after what is it called? Um, Borderlines and oh Aliens. God. Uh, border, Borderlines and Aliens. Yeah, loved this. I I thought, oh, is this a Breeders cover? You know, <laughs> has, he, has he put that? And then it started and I was like, oh, no. Um, love the drums. Sick bass. Um, it actually reminded me a lot of Nova Twins. Oh, Baseline yeah. Bitch by Nova Twins is very similar because it also has a kind of dirty bass. And she's also kind of shout singing in the in the same way. So I I, I would recommend checking out that song. That's from there from their EP before, like from 2016. So similar, similar mm. time. It shouldn't work, but it does. Love it. And I, I've wrote, I would have never guessed you like this. So I, I you know, I, you put this on a little bit for me, I guess, because you thought that, that I would. <laughs> that makes sense. Like, oh, this would make my top 20 songs by then. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, no, it's both again. Surprisingly, guys, it's good life. Um, and then mm. I thought, I take that, I take it down because we do, like every band, <laughs> we have to have a few slow ones, guys, for the people to cuddle at the end of the night. And I gave, the, they had two slow songs of the Debra album. Mm-hmm. And I thought, well, which one is she going to hate the least? And now thinking you're going to hate <laughs> it because it is quite soppy. And if you ever heard of a band called Group Love, this is what you'd imagine they sound like. And I've gone with Betty's a Bombshell. Yeah, this was my least favorite. Um, what is it about? Yeah, <laughs> no, I have no idea. But it, but it yeah. goes to places that you don't expect. I like how it ends. That's what I put on there. Honestly, like with the other songs that I didn't like, I put in details. But I, I clearly didn't like anything about this because I've just written no, no, no least favorite. And then I put is this about there? And then stopped there because <laughs> I think I, I I did go and look at the lyrics and was like right. Well, is this about a friend of theirs? Is this about their relationship, but they're calling it something else? Like, I, I don't really understand. So, can you, because I was like, okay, let's see if I can connect to it on, a, on another way. Um, so this was, I th- yeah, my least favorite on this. So I, I did actually prefer this to your next pick. Uh, uh, sorry, I preferred your next pick to this. So the next pick to a wild card. I had never even heard the song until I sat down mm-hmm. to make the playlist. Okay. I had seen the film. Paper Town, which is another of these alternative team movies when you know it's it's kind of it's, she's know, a rebel, yeah, yeah. she's alternative. Yeah, yeah, and she's so different, so fascinating. I'd do anything to be with her. It's one of those sort of films that's came yeah. big over the last 10 years. It's called No Drama Queen, which I this is just on the soundtrack. There's even a music video randomly with the uh, the cast and the band singing. So they they, they, oh, they okay. probably thought it was gonna be a a, a big hit. After well, like, like I said earlier, they had that the, the song on the um oh the fault in our yes, stars yes yeah, so yeah so yeah they're on the sound oh that's the same director I think oh no sorry it's the the it's based hang on it's either the same director or it's based on the guy who wrote same author but both those books yeah <laughs> same author thank you yes. <laughs> same author yeah so yeah. um they, they did a track called Let Me In off uh, from the fault in the stars soundtrack which I believe mm-hmm. came a big hit 
I personally find it quite dull. So I believe that because they did that, that they got offered a similar film and a similar soundtrack, which is why we have No Drama Queen. But I think this is a pretty decent song, and I'm sad it ends too early. The last motif is pretty cool, but hey. Okay, well, then I need to go listen to it again because, um, yeah, when I saw it was from Paper Towns, I thought, oh, no. <laughs> like, because I, I haven't seen Paper Towns, but I know it's a teen movie and, and an American teen movie. At that. And listen, you know, sometimes American films have excellent soundtracks. Um, I just saw Malcolm and Marie, and I really enjoyed that soundtrack. Uh, and it's very literal nature. But um, I, I saw Paper Towns. I was already primed for Prejudice. And yeah, it, it was Americana, poppy, very REM. I did appreciate their harmonizing in the chorus, but I cut it short because I was so keen to go and listen to Borderlines and Aliens again. <laughs> so I actually, so I was like, I'm going to have nothing, nothing more interesting to say about this. Now I just want to go and listen to Borderlines and Aliens again. Um, and hear her shout Arigato at the top of her voice. Brilliant. <laughs> I think that um, Borderlines and Aliens made my best 2015 CD. So. Oh, actually, yeah. I'm surprised that Deleted didn't make your best of 2020 then. Because when you... it's one of those annoying songs, but it technically came out November 2019. So it's on oh, my best of 2019 oh, soundtrack, you see. Like, okay, I could... and I didn't know you then, uh... so I, we didn't have the discussion. Okay. Yeah, because I was just like, well, he's included like two songs from 2020, and one of them is interesting, and it wasn't on the best of 2020. Like, um, Okay, yeah, fair enough. So if I was you, I would listen to this playlist a few times, and I think the... Uh, the slower, less in your face tracks you may grow on you because I think there's more to the band yes. than, than people imagine. Like, like I said, they're not just a, they're not like fun to me. Fun, yeah, they have quite a cynical, oh, this is a hook. Let's keep doing that hook again and again, sort of like uh, routine. Um, mm-hmm. I think that there's more to, to group love, maybe because but they came from, you know, they came from real musicians wanting to do music because, like, you know, they were struggling artists and they were just lucky that one of them was the son of a very rich man, um, I think. <laughs> <laughs> as with the, as with so many things. Yeah, I definitely, like, I, I'm i really happy to, to have discovered Group Love and I'm super keen to see them live now. And, you know, if if there's a link between the two bands, you know, if, if someone said, right, there's this band called Queens of the Stone Age, here's the song, I Never Came, I would have been like, well, okay, yeah, it's a rock ballad, so what? sort of thing i think the reason i like i never came by queens of the stone age is precisely because it's not a very queens of the stone agey song uh in parts and you appreciate it in the context of their whole discography i definitely think that with a band with songs that are so different and even yeah within the songs that's so different yeah it's gonna take multiple listens so i will definitely be continuing to listen to group love probably going to spreading rumors and the song that cannonball comes from big mess because that's where the songs that i like are so that's probably the best place to start but yeah i i will absolutely keep an open open mind for the slower songs because i guess once you're once you're used to that sound like it is it is a band that takes some getting used to and i, I listened to it well twice although yeah like i said not not uh the last two of those i listened to once with some of them i just couldn't quite get a handle on it and i think multiple listens and a life setting I'm sure would change and improve my opinion. And yeah, I, I still find it baffling. Why are they not bigger outside of the USA? It's odd for I me. Mean. Yeah, I think it's USA and Australia were the were the the towns. Yeah. Chicago, Los Angeles, Dallas, Sydney and Atlanta. I guess I think when it comes to American culture in the UK at least, very often it is more mainstream bands who are bigger, if that makes sense. I feel like, you know, well, you, you lived in Seattle, right? Um, like I went to Seattle with my with my ex-boyfriend because we were both really into it as a city, but we didn't really know anyone else who was. It's like everyone else would rather go to Florida or California or somewhere else. But Seattle, it had this, yeah, this alternative vibe that was grunge, which was massive, but it turns out it's so much more. Like Jimi Hendrix was from there. Mix a lot was from from there, all this kind of stuff, and it just has this kind of alternative energy. And when I visited the US, you you have all these, you know, we talked about it a bit in Athens, Georgia. You have all these college towns and all this alternative scene going on. That I think that unless you are into the American alternative scene broadly, you're not gonna check out. So if you're watching, or slash, if you're young, right, they have a lot of 
followers on Spotify, I'm guessing if we looked at the age breakdown, it would be quite young, especially because they're in teen films. So it could be a generational thing as well. But I think that they, they're they not easily categorizable into the kind of genres that US bands are, are famous for in the UK and in Europe. And yeah, I guess they're difficult to market, right? Yeah, I, I guess you'd either probably go down the pop route first, wouldn't you, and try to make her vocals rather than him. He could be a bit too whiny for some of the uh, pop stations. But you know, I mean, some of the big singles, like Ways to Go, I mean, fun was a big hit in the UK. That's better than that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So who knows? I mean, they, they could still come big in the UK. We just don't know, guys. Who knows about guitar music these days? But how, what was the capacity of the venue that you saw them in? Like, what kind of uh, venues are they playing? It was the first ever gig in a brand new venue owned by Ben from Mumford and Sons, I believe. Oh, okay. In a random street in King's Cross somewhere. So for me, yeah, amazing. For their energy, seeing them in a small venue must be incredible. Yeah, yeah. And you could tell they loved it as well. Hence, what they could jump into the audience. I and mean, they kept doing it because obviously they're not meant to do that in America for a long, long time. When this all dies down, guys, and you're anywhere near a group club concert, check them out. So, do you think they are under or overrated? I don't know, to be honest, because I, I don't think I can answer that question until I've seen them live. From what you've said, from the one video I've seen, there's something almost magical about them live. And I, I feel like I'm not going to get the full grasp of the band. So if I see them live and they're fantastic, then I'll probably say yes, they are underrated because they should be bigger because they're so amazing live. But they have a ton of followers. They have a ton of listeners. So there's clearly an audience. And because at this stage, I don't like everything by them. You know, some, some of the playlists that you've given, you know, I like pretty much everything. Um, and this wasn't one of them. I wouldn't say that they're underrated at this stage, but I, I wouldn't say they're overrated. I, I yeah, it's, uh, it's, I'm annoyingly in the middle for this one. Well, after Crowded House, I would take that as <laughs> enough. <laughs> the trauma of Crowded House. <laughs> so thank you guys for listening to another podcast and let us know your thoughts on either band. See you. Goodbye. Okay, well, thank you very much for sticking to the end of our first episode of season two. We have nine other episodes coming out over the next nine weeks, ten weeks, and we'll actually have a little bonus episode in the middle of the week. We're not going to tell you what it is. Fran's going to be introducing that one, but maybe if you're a group of fan, you'll figure out what was missing in this episode and what we might be talking about then. If you enjoyed this, you know, you can go and check out all of our season one episodes. I am happy to say that the sound quality for the upcoming season two episodes is much better. And you can get in touch with us. We are on Twitter, OU Music Pod. We are on Instagram at Over Underrated Music Pod. And you can even email us, guys. We are Over Underrated Music Pod at gmail.com. In the meantime, I'll go back to the fictional beach with my fictional cocktail, sink my feet in the sand and have a great time. Bye. Maybe you